Hello. Hello. You all look beautiful. I can't see any of you. Okay. Um, so I'm talking today about the benefits of designing with very low self-esteem and um, having low self-esteem in general, which is something which I'm sure none of you suffer from, but I do. So um, do you think your work's good enough? I'd be willing to take a bet that everybody in this room wants to do good work. And I can answer that question for you right now. Do you think your work is good enough? No, it's not good enough. No, it's not. And the reason why I can say that confidently is because nobody's work is good enough, ever. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about ruts. I love ruts. Here's an example of a good one. This helps a tram not run into you as long as you don't stand on the tram tracks. I used to live in Amsterdam. I did stand on tram tracks, nearly died, just saying. Um, are you working? Yep. Um, here's, here's a question I'm sure uh, you've all asked yourself. What is the meal that you would eat every day for the rest of your life if you had to eat one meal <laughs> and no other meal? And this is mine, except for the red onion. I would take that off. But apart from that, this is the meal I would eat. With a can of Britvic Citrus Spring, which was discontinued in about 1998. So I have had to change that part of my ideal meal. Um, I would have a cheese baked potato, and I've got a particular way of eating it as well. I scoop out the insides and eat the skin first, because the skin is good for you, but I don't like it as much as the rest. So I eat that first, and then I make cheesy mash out of the rest of it. And then I have my salad, because I know I have to eat that as well. And that gives me time for the cheese to melt, and then it turns into lovely cheese mash, and then I eat that last. And then I wash it down with the citrus spring, which I can't get anymore, so I'm sad about that. If you want to see what Citrus Spring looks like, you can go to canmuseum.com, <laughs> which I did, and it looks just like how I remember it. I'm really sad it doesn't exist anymore. So I really like routine and convention. It's our way of optimising on positive experiences, and it's the reason we all, give, all have parties and give each other presents, and I love Christmas, don't believe in God, love Christmas. Um, it's the shortcut we use when we don't know why something is good. So the pattern that we got into at UX at the BBC was regular user research during development. So we'd do nice personas and we'd work them through scenarios and we'd do some designing and then we'd do some researching and that was usually task-based user testing in a lab quite a lot of the time. Um, and you know we'd use the cloud protocol and uh, and then we'd build stuff and then quite often you know we might do some research up, right up front and then get into it or sometimes we'd even go round and round several times and um, you know we made some pretty successful stuff doing that you know and and uh, did a lot of user research and I started at the BBC as a user researcher so that was good for me. Um, I did nine rounds of user testing on a product once and went <coughs> mental but anyway. Um, so we made some successful stuff. This is um, BBC News online yesterday, and this is um, the Glastonbury site that they launched recently, or last year, obviously. And um, this is iPlayer. So, you know, what's the problem? Well, we're redesigning all of those at the moment, and lots of other things as well. Um, turns out cheesy baked potatoes are quite bad for you. <laughs> Still eat them, but there you go. Um, Convention is the shortcut we use when we don't know why something is good. And not knowing why something is good causes problems. It has unintended consequences. Um, you, you spend a lot of time doing the same thing. You start to create not just convention, but tradition, superstition. You start having holy wars about it, and you don't even know why. So that's the problem with these things. Um, so we started to find that we wanted specialists in design and specialists in research and specialists in building things. And there was a sort of slight separation of who those people were. They stopped being the same people. Um, and over time, those walls started to really form in between them. And um, they started really not being able to talk to each other very well sometimes. They started to not really understand what the other people were doing and started looking at the other people and saying, that UX isn't very good UX, actually. What I do is good UX and you smell. Um, <laughs> and that's what happens. You start creating unnecessary separation. You start not understanding the whole story 
of uh, user experience. So that's one in unintended consequence of being in our rut. And then imagine, if you will, that you're a little designer person, um, or a large designer person, or medium-sized, whatever. Um, and let's talk about what it's like to make something. There's a couple of things which I'm happy to take 98% credit for making. Um, and here's one of them. Um, I spent nine months feeling too pukey for food, too hungry not to eat, too tired to work, too busy to sleep. She kicked me from the inside, gave me heartburn, and turned up at St Mary's just up the road um, from here, just before her dad had time to park the car. I know what you're thinking. Ugly baby. <laughs> can't help it. I'm sitting here making doe eyes at these wrinkly midget and you just know there's no way that you can see any, say anything if you want to keep your voice box intact. And I've left and you're left with a single thought in your head. <laughs> Ugly baby. But here's the thing. I know barely four minutes in I knew I'd given birth to Dobby the house elf. Um, but I still would have ripped your voice box out if you'd said anything. The good thing about babies is they stop looking weird after a few days. And after a couple of months, they pretty much all look like cute babies. Look at Prince George the other day um, on the news. At least they do to their parents. Um, so when your, design get, when your design gets feedback, you're being told your baby's ugly. You are. I've seen designers ask researchers to edit evidence from user research. Um, I've, and I've seen, <laughs> I've seen strange behaviours happening. And they know, they know that their baby's ugly. Most of the time they know their baby's ugly. Some of the time they've spent so much time polishing it that they've lost track of the fact that their baby's ugly because they've just been there too long. Um, and they've forgiven the baby for being ugly and carried on regardless. Um, but the fact is, they have an ugly baby and all that's happened is someone has told them so. And it's not a baby, it's a stupid design, it doesn't matter. So, that's one problem. The other thing we were finding is that actually the more senior designers were less and less involved in user research. I'm not psychic about why that was, but I suspect they were feeling like they needed to show they were expert enough not to need design research. Um, I think that does happen, and I think it happens every time someone steps up, they feel a bit like, I need to know more now, I need to prove I know more. When it comes to design, absolutely not. No, no, none of us no knows anything. All we have is asking people. So, on the other side of it, obviously, if you've got, design if you've got designers telling you to edit things and telling you how to run research and coming at you with massive confirmation bias, then of course the researchers just wouldn't trust these maniacs to get involved in the research at all. Um, so they're just more and more just going, get away, this is my job now, out of the way, I'll do this and I'll come back to you with my thing. And none of this is positive, it doesn't help, nobody's engaged and it's much, much easier to say no, I'm not going to listen to you when you haven't got someone involved in their process. So. What are we doing differently, other than going in with a blue hat and demanding everyone puts their weapons down? Well, um, we've had to think about it, and obviously, you need to bring those disciplines more together again. Yay, happy love time. Um, so this is, um, this is an adaptation from a blog entry by John Lilly, and if you get this afterwards, I've got the link in it. Um, so he talks about uh, design like you're right, test like you're wrong. Um, we need everyone to be part of the same process. We have to get de designers to feel fine about calling their babies ugly and researchers to feel fine about trusting designers to do some of their own research. Um, it's not a new idea. We're talking about this in the artist way, which is a book that I was introduced when I was a sort of grumpy teenager, and I'm sure a lot of you know about it. Um, you know, all that design like you're right, test like you're wrong is, is creator mode, editor mode. So, if you've ever done any sort of creative endeavour, if you've sketched or written or played music or done anything that makes something where there wasn't something before, um, you know that you have to be super confident, maybe even arrogant half of the time when you're making the thing, and then you have to be hypercritical the other half of the time. You have to kind of split your personality into those modes. And if you try and do them both together, you become creatively constipated because it slows the process down so much. So you've got to have a mode where you're making stuff, and then you stop that and say, now I'm going to rip it to 
rip it to shreds. And, you know, designers in our team, obviously, they've been doing this in their own way. They've been polishing and polishing and polishing, but they haven't been doing that with the mind of, I need to make sure that users are part of that editor mode, and I need to make sure other people are part of that editor mode. Um, so your editor guy should be perfectly happy to rip up the thing and tell you that it's crappy. Um, our approach to UX has separated those modes into separate people some of the time, and um, then they've been surprised that they don't get on. Um, if you're closer together in time, in space, and sometimes even in the same head, then obviously those things are going to improve. So we're doing things faster. We've got design sprints, and here's an oblig obligatory picture of some people scratching their heads and looking at post-it notes. Um, Ta-da! This is um, part of the homepage team that are working on the new version of what we're going to do about bbc.co.uk. Um, and they've been trying out this method, which is literally five days. We've had ones that are 10 days as well, and lots of other variations. Um, first day, uh, make sure that you understand the, pro pro um, the problem, and something they were calling storifying, which I'm not cool with. Um, and then the second day, come up with an, as many ideas as you like. Third day, decide which one, start prototyping. Fourth day, make the prototype. Day five, use the research. End of day five, go for drinks. Um, and they would run that for about six weeks, and they produced an app which is launchable bar stakeholders. So I can show you that afterwards, but it's pre-launched, so obviously I can't show you right now. Um, so, and then you just keep doing that. So. Um, that weekly we've, we've done that weekly repeat over six weeks, over eight, over ten, seeing how you can go. The only thing that's important about it is you will burn out if you do it for too long. Um, you've got to have the focus and ability to kind of stop and have some downtime. I wouldn't recommend just running all of your design like that forever or you'll go mad. Um, so when they're tiring and you can't do it all the time without burning out, um, for the rest of the time we've got kind of multiple long-term projects running. Um, so we have research programs. And what that is, is in Salford, we carry out fortnightly user research and open it to all the project teams. They have a, they have a slot booked in advance. And rather than it taking about four to five weeks to commission and run user research with an external team, what this does is allow the project team to spend about four days on it and have start day one is getting the materials together and day four is having the answers. Um, that's been fantastic. Um, so we're trying a few different methods of that. So we've got run, one running in Salford, we've got run, running in central London, and we're just setting one up in West London as well. <coughs> we're also repositioning research um, to force it into the process earlier and to think of it in a new way. Now, the um, the idea around this is research as inspiration, research not science, not scientific. We're not talking about statistically significant numbers of people. We're talking about six people telling you something. We're talking about not, being, not having to book people in advance, about going out and carrying out guerrilla research yourself, and for that to be a valuable part of your process. So there's a few ways in which we're kind of encouraging that. First one is this is my friend Kai. She's going to be furious that I use this picture of her. Um, this is, um, we ran a big away day uh, thanks to uh, Manchester School of Art for lending us a massive lecture hall there. Um, and we're the BBC, so none of your licence fee was spent on that. We got it for free. Um, and we created a giant cardboard vending machine out of 10 sections made by 10 different teams. And every single person that was there, was 110 people, went through the whole machine. And every single person was there for a test subject in that. So we had live A-B testing. And at the end of the day, people could see the results. Um, so the outcome of that was we made something cool in three hours. Everyone tried it out at least once. We did the A-B testing. We had results. And it kind of drove home that testing is cheap, fun, and easy. Um, and then we chucked everything out. And what was really interesting was that chucking everything out, which is an important part of proto prototyping, was the thing that the design researchers had the hardest time seeing. They never see that part of the process. So actually seeing something being destroyed um, upset them. It was quite funny. Um, um, so everybody's a researcher is the new plan. Um, the next thing up that we're doing is creating design research champions. So everybody gets um, basics course run by our research specialists. 
and everybody gets um, depth interview training because that's the core of all, lots and lots of different techniques around user research. So if you can do the depth interview part, you can run a decent task-based user testing session. You can run guerrilla testing. You've got the start for doing a decent diary study, ethnography. So hopefully, that's how it's going to work. Uh, I've just started um, planning that training. Um, and then they start running and commissioning their own research without needing my research specialist to get involved in every single one. I've got four research specialists and about 110 designers. So, um, yeah, so wish us luck. <laughs> um, the main things to remember. Um, there are some enemies of good UX and they live in your mind. They're not outside. Clients, boo. Product owners, boo. Whatever. That's all just... That's the external factor, sure they're there, but with the right handling, I am convinced anyone in here can handle that. Um, but I think the hardest things to combat are <coughs> prioritizing the wrong things, otherwise known as we don't have time, we don't have money. You do, it's especially the money thing. Now, I speak as the BBC and we spend money on user research and we're very lucky, but you can do user research without spending money on it. And if you've got four days to design something, as you can see from that process that we were running, we spent a day of that doing user research. And we'd only spent a very short amount of time doing design before we got something in front of them. You can go out and observe users before, um, before you've put pen to paper at all. Um, so I don't buy it. If you think that you're doing, if you, do, if you think you don't have time, you think that you don't have the budget, that's in your head. Um, Thinking that you're already doing a pretty good job, otherwise known as ignorance, atrophy, apathy, complacency. I don't know, I don't care, and I'm too busy. This is, this is a huge problem, and it comes from the normal frustrations of living in the world. Everyone does this, and I'm the worst. Um, to which I say, remember what Samuel Beckett said, fail again, fail better. That is the best design that we can do, and that's what we're always doing at the BBC. Thank you.